Well, we are continuing our series in the book of 1 Samuel, and we're coming to the very end. We're coming to the end of 1 Samuel. Now, in the Bible, 1 and 2 Samuel were originally one book. But I like how it's split, and I like where the natural break is, because we see, arguably, David's worst moments. You could say this was David's rock bottom. And I think this is important for us because I, I love this story so much. It's one of my favorite stories in the book of 1 Samuel because so often in life we get setups or we get setbacks, sorry. We get setbacks. We think things are going to go one way. They don't happen the way that we expect them to. We get delays. We get disappointments. We get frustrations. We get failures. And the start of this story is a tremendous failure for David. But what's amazing is, is that when you have faith in God, you don't see setbacks as setbacks. When you have faith in God, you know that a setback is a setup for a comeback. And here's the thing is, is that everyone loves a comeback story. There's so much more dramatic there's so much more exciting. There's so much more rewarding when you're watching a sports match and rather than just crushing the other team 10-0, is it, no, you go down and is it going to win? Is it going to lose? And then you come back and you win it at the very last moment. That's what everyone loves. Everyone loves a comeback and everyone loves a comeback kid. And that was David. David was the ultimate comeback kid. And that's the title of my lesson today, The Comeback Kid. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 30, we're going to see David in a tremendous moment where he comes back from a crushing defeat. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, in verse 1, it says, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Point number one, epic failure. This is what you call an epic failure. It, it gets, this is about as bad as it gets. So David, he turns against his own people. He allies himself with the Philistines. Then he goes off to join the Philistine army to fight against his own people. His men are the greatest warriors in the land. And what happens? The Philistines don't want him in their army. They reject him. David has to leave humiliated. And so, like a dog with his tail between his legs, he leaves the Philistine army to go back home to his little village of Ziklag. And what happens when he gets there? It's burnt to the ground. And all the women, all the children, they've been taken captive. This is pretty bad. This is a pretty epic failure. And what happens is, is that this is potentially the end for David. Is, is that his army, loyal followers to the death, they've been hunted down by Saul. They've had all these battles. They're like, no, nah, we're done. We're done. David, we're done. We're just going to kill you. It's over. And you could really say that this is David's rock bottom. This is as bad as it gets, where he's really questioning, like, is this it? Is this where I'm going to die? Like, I survived Saul just to be killed by my own men. What you see is, is that the, the men were very bitter. They were very bitter and resentful towards David. And I, I'll be honest, is, is that I can struggle with this, is that I, I, when I first became a disciple, I really struggled with bitterness and resentment. Like, if people hurt me, like, pff, that's it, we're done. And uh, over my discipleship, I, I've grown a lot in this. I've grown in my forgiveness, but it still comes up. 
is that even this morning is, is that uh, I was talking, I was talking about someone that I just had some feelings about. And Rebecca was like, are you okay, babe? Like, you, you, you feel like you got some unforgiveness in your heart. And I was like, what? what? What are you talking about? Where would that come from? She's like, well, probably the repeated injuries this person has done against you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And then she left and and I prayed. I was like, yeah, God, that's that's bad. I, I need to forgive them. And I walked out about 30 seconds later. I was like, babe, you are so right. I have bad heart. And I just forgive this person. It's like, great. I feel better now. <laughs> and it's like, I, I struggle when someone hurts me. I have a hard time forgiving them. And it's, it's just a sin. I'm, I've got weaknesses like all of you. Like, don't judge me. <laughs> but when, when people for when people hurt me, it's like, OK, I can get over that. But if people hurt my kids, that's another level. Like, I think that these guys were a bit like that. Like, okay, David, whatever's going to happen to us, if we die or whatever. But, man, that was my wife. That your mistake, we're here because you told us to come here. We went to go fight because you told us to go fight. And now our families have been hurt because of your failure, because of your mistake as a leader. It's like, that's tough. That's really hard. It can be really challenging as a leader, particularly when your mistakes hurt other people, innocent people. Like, again, the, these, these wives, these children, they didn't do anything wrong. But because David was not following God's will and he left to go and to join the Philistine army, now he gets disciplined by God. And this was really tough. This was really tough for him. And I really relate to this, uh, particularly when we came here to plant the church in Edinburgh. And I came filled with grandiose visions of glory, Colby Gray, Mr. Evangelist Extraordinaire. I'm going to come, and I'm going to show everyone how it's done. I'm going to have the model church plant. I'm going to right the wrongs of the movement. And sure enough, seven months later, we had zero baptisms. And it was really bad. It was really bad because we were burning through the money that we had. We hadn't raised the contribution to be self-supporting. And we got to a point where it was like, okay, maybe this is it. Maybe, maybe I'm not meant to be an evangelist. Okay, I brought my family here. I brought my, my, my brothers, my sisters. They quit their jobs. They left their families behind only to crash and burn. And to fail in my very first church planting. And I really had to, to search my heart. And I really had to, to really see, like, okay, like, what am I really made of? And that's the great thing about failures. We, we were speaking earlier this week about fantastic failures. And I don't imagine that David saw this as a fantastic failure in the moment. I, this was potentially a life-ending failure. But when you have such epic failures, when you're able to hit rock bottom, it forces you to ask yourself really tough questions. Who am I? What do I believe? And what you see about David is that even though David has, has really abandoned God, he's left God for the last 18 months when he's in Philistine territory, he's just off doing his own thing. He's like, wait a minute. What about God? Well, I, I remember my God. And this is where some of us, when it comes to these setbacks that we have, when it comes to these failures, these hard times, it actually brings us back to God in a way that nothing else ever could. And this was really a, a defining moment in David's life, is, is that this completely changes David. It completely changes David's relationship with God. And I remember, it was one prayer. It was a single prayer. I went out, and I was ready to quit. I was ready to give up. I was ready to pack up our bags and go back to London, tail between my legs, defeated. Maybe I'm not meant to be in the ministry. And I remember one prayer. It was like, no, no. Nope. I am an evangelist. God has chosen me. I'm going to build the church here. And I'm the David for Edinburgh. And just like David, I found strength in the Lord. This leads me to my second point. Where does your strength come from? In verse 7, 
Then David said to Abathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. What we see here about this epic failure and why it's so important for a really defining David's life, particularly David's life moving forward, is, is that it causes him to question where his strength comes from. Because what you see is that his strength had run out. Is, is that David was a very charismatic leader. He was very, people naturally were drawn to him. They liked him. He was very influential. He was very successful. But what you see is that in this moment, all that success had run dry. All that charisma had run out. All that influence, everything that he had built up into this point was gone. And he's forced to ask himself, where does my strength come from? And this is the question for you, is, is that when you fail, when you epically blow it, when you hit rock bottom, when all of your success, all of your intellect, all of your talent, when all of that goes, who are you? And where does your strength come from? Well, David answers this in Psalms, in Psalms 121. And Psalm 121 in verse 1, it says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. We know in the Old Testament, a mountain represents the nations. David's looking to the nations. He's looking to Israel. He's looking to Saul. Saul can't help him in this moment. He's looking to the nation of the Philistines. He's looking to the king that he can't help him. He says, no, no, no. My help comes from God. I'm not looking to people. I'm not looking to countries. I'm not looking to my army. I'm, God is the one that gives me strength. And when God gives you strength, nothing can stop you. And this is what we see is, is that David, whenever he remembers this, is, is that he forgot this. He was successful. He was powerful. He had an army. He was able to destroy his enemies. And this can happen to us sometimes. Is that sometimes success can harden our hearts where we think that we're something that we're not. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if this happened to David. He's just spent the last year and a half just destroying everyone. When he goes into the battle with the Philistines, he's like, just you wait. Watch what your servant can do, man. I'm going to just destroy the enemy with my awesome army. And, David, and God has to humble David. And he's like, hey, let me remind you. Let me remind you who you are. This is that I'm the one that raised you up. You didn't raise yourself up. I think that this is very important for us. If you go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. What does this look like practically? Is, is that we, we've got the principle of our strength coming from God, but practically, how do we put that into practice? Well, David does it here. Verse 7. Then David said to Abathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. I think a lot of times when I look at disciples' lives, is that they can have a hard time, they can have a setback, they can have a disappointment and a failure, and they're like, okay, my strength's in God. And? It's like, yeah, my strength's in God. And? What are you going to do? Because disciples, they're like, yep, I prayed about it. Good. That, that's a good thing to do. I'm glad you prayed about your problem. But what are you going to do? <laughs> what can happen is, is that disciples, where, when you have a hard time, you have a challenge or whatever, you can get down. You're like, okay, I'm going to go to God. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. And <laughs> do nothing and wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for someone to tell me what to do. But that wasn't David's heart. See, David had a relentless solution focus. He's like, okay, the town's been burned down. All the people have been captured. Okay, let's go get them. 
Now, he didn't just like go off and do his own thing on his own wisdom and his own plan or whatever. He went to God and he prayed, but he prayed about his plan. You see, David wasn't going to wait around for things to get better. Like, well, God, I'm just going to pray and hopefully you bring back all these families that have been captured. But no. And I think this is the thing a lot of disciples don't get. This is where they can stay in a state of failure. When something bad happens, when you get disciplined, when God has to humble you, you're like, I'm just being disciplined. Oh, God's humbling me. It's like, yeah. And (laughs) you got to do something about it. What you see about David is that David had a plan and and he he had faith in his plan. He's like, okay, like God, like I believe that we can go, we can capture them, we can rescue them. Like this was a very ambitious plan is is that this is a a large army as we're about to find that's come and has destroyed the city, has taken everyone captive. They're, They're several days ahead of David. And he's like, God, should I do this or not? This is the plan that I have on my heart. Are you gonna bless this? And God's like, yep, I'm gonna bless it. You'll be successful. I remember when um, it was we had zero baptism, seven months, was nothing going on. And um, I, I got a, a, a call from, uh, there was this guy from Ukraine that was like, yeah, there's this guy from Ukraine. He wants to uh, find a church that he can join. And uh, it was, he was like way out at the airport. And I remember thinking like, okay, if I travel out to the airport and I meet with him, we study the Bible, and I come back. It's basically going to take all day. And I was like, I really should be trying to get, like, a lot of Bible studies at this point. Because it was, like, literally the day after. So the day after I had my life-changing prayer, then there was this, like, we've got one Bible study. I was like, okay, maybe this is the guy. And I remember praying. I was like, God, do you want me to go all the way out of Edinburgh to meet with this one guy? Like, is this? And I was like, God said yes. I was like, okay, I'm going to go out. And I remember thinking, and I, I went out with Serge. And I remember thinking, I was like, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to spend all day with this one guy. And God is going to bless it. And he's going to bring about a baptism. And I remember we went out and we met with this guy and he didn't speak any English. And it was just me and Serge. And Serge spoke to him all day in Russia. And I was just sitting there like just (laughs) praying. I was like, God, please let this guy get baptized. (laughs) And he never got baptized. But on the way back, I got a message from a guy that was looking for a church. And he's like, hey, I'm on your website and I want to find out how do I join your church? And two weeks later, Boaz got baptized on my birthday. And he was the first guy. God blessed it. It was God. I didn't do it, but I was going with a plan. I think this is really important for us as disciples is is that... um, God doesn't bless us when we get depressed. God doesn't bless us when we get passive, when we're just waiting for someone else to tell us what to do. We're waiting for someone else to fix our problems. That wasn't David. David had a relentless solution focus. He's like, okay, what do I do now? I've been disciplined. I've been humbled. My guys want to kill me. God, what should I do? Okay, I'm going to do this with faith, and I know that God is going to bless it. I want to challenge you. When you have setbacks in your life, Don't get down. Don't get depressed. Don't get bewildered, perplexed. Oh, no, what do I do now? Go pray. Go get strengthened by God and then go take action because God will bless it. So David pursues the Amalekites. He finds one of the uh, Amalekite slaves, an Egyptian, speaks to him. The Egyptian takes him to the outside of the camp. Now, David's army had 600 people, and 200 of them stayed behind. So David is going into this battle with 400 guys. That's important. We're going to see this in a minute. Verse 16. He led David down, and there they were, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else that had been taken. David brought everything back. Point number three, a crushing defeat. The story starts off with 
a crushing defeat against David. Whereas like, man, you, your home has been burned to the ground. Everything you owned of value has been taken. Everyone you love has been taken. And that's pretty bad. When I think about a crushing defeat, I think about Satan. And Satan was completely destroyed on Calvary when Jesus died on the cross. That was a crushing defeat. But he doesn't see it that way. And Satan keeps coming back to slow us down. And Satan wants to discourage us. He wants to fill us with doubt. He wants us to question our convictions. And he wants to try to slow us down. But he can't stop us. He can just have these minor setbacks. All Satan can do is just delay us. And what you see about David is that how does David respond to this setback, to this delay? He comes back with a crushing defeat of his enemy. Now, David goes with 400 guys. And it says that none of the enemy got away except for 400 guys that escaped on camelback. So what does that tell you? The Amalekite army was much bigger than 400 people. If everyone was killed except for these 400 guys. Like, I don't know how big it was. But if, if, if it, it was probably bigger than, like, not 800, because it would, would have said, oh, it killed half of the people and half of them escaped. It wasn't bigger than 1,000, or it would have been bigger than 1,000. Otherwise, they would have said it killed most of the people and 400 got away. Like, I don't know how big this army was. But it was so big that it was like, yeah, they killed everyone except for these 400 people that aren't even worth counting. That's a pretty crushing defeat. And we see is is that how did David fight? It says in verse 17, David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day. So what was this? This was a nighttime battle. Now, we don't really understand this because we have artificial light. But if you go out in the wilderness, it is black. You can't see nothing. So what was this? This was a nighttime slaughter where David came at night as the Amalekites' worst nightmare. And he's just coming, and he's killing them in the dead of darkness. They don't know what's going on. There's pandemonium. There's confusion. And he killed everyone. This was a crushing defeat where David absolutely obliterated his enemies. I think this is important for us as disciples because Satan comes against us with these setbacks where he wants to discourage us. And we have to come back with the heart of David. Where it's like, oh, no, 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 no. This setback is a setup for a comeback. I'm the comeback kid. And I'm going to crush the enemies of God. I think about uh, a time, Rebecca and I, we were leading the West region. And we were studying the Bible with this amazing French girl. She was so awesome. She was so beautiful. She was so talented and charismatic. Everyone loved her. She came to our house. We cooked her food. She was an amazing campus student. And I remember counting the cost with her the day before she was supposed to get baptized. She's like, oh, oh I, I got to give up my kung fu on Wednesday. Oh, oh, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And she left. So stupid. But she absolutely devastated all of us. We were so heartbroken because we loved this girl so much. And no one was more devastated than Rebecca. And I'm so proud of my wife is that this was Saturday. Saturday, she's like, nah, don't want to do this. I'm done. I don't actually want to become a Christian. And Rebecca went out there and she cried until she had no more tears left to cry. And she's like, God, you need to send me another woman who's going to get baptized. And the next day, Claire V. walked into church. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty crushing defeat of Satan. Where it's like, oh, you want to discourage me? There's this French girl that's supposed to get baptized and she leaves? That's fine. God's going to bring another French girl. A better French girl. And then Claire v. came with us on the mission team here, and she's been with us every step of the way. I was like, man, that's a pretty crushing defeat of Satan and his schemes. I remember 
when, uh, th again, things were really challenging here. It was our first year here in Edinburgh. And I got an opportunity to go and to, to meet with some, a number of politicians in uh, the parliamentary building at uh, Holyrood. And I went there and I was so insecure and so filled with fear. And I, I really messed up. It was pretty, it was a really like humiliating, epic failure. And I just felt so like just bad and weak and feeble. And I was like, oh man, this was a really good opportunity. I really could have really made some, some great impact and I could have had some great contacts that would have really helped the church. And wow, like that really is really disappointing. And I remember leaving because I, I had to leave this meeting with all these uh, MPs to go to a Bible study. And I was like, okay, well, one thing I know how to do really well is study the Bible with people. And I'm going to go and I'm going to crush this Bible study. I don't know who it is, but whoever it is, they're getting baptized. And I walked in and showed up, and that was the very first time that I met Jacob. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, no, I'm an evangelist. I'm going to make a disciple. Whoever's getting, whoever's this Bible study is, he's going to get baptized. And sure enough, Jacob got baptized. And last night, to see Jacob and Clary getting engaged, that they're going to be married, and they're going to be incredible pillars in the church here in Edinburgh, and really to be able to affect all the churches all throughout Scotland and Europe, it's like, that is a pretty crushing defeat of Satan. It's like, nice try. Good luck trying to set us back. You know that a setback is a setup for a comeback. That's how we need to respond is that Satan cannot stop us. He can just delay us. He can just slow us down. But when we have these setbacks, when we have these disappointments, when we have these failures, this is how we need to respond. With the heart of David, we got to get strengthened by God. we got to be proactive with a plan. And we need to go back and we need to have a crushing victory where we destroy the armies of darkness by the power of our God. Is that we didn't come here to Edinburgh to take place. We came here to take over. And that's the spirit that we need to have, is, is that we've had a phenomenal year this year. You look back at all the miracles, all the victories, all the great things that have happened, but we're going to go back, we're going to go down to London, we're going to have an incredible conference, and we're going to come back, and we're going to have the best two months of the entire year. We're going to have the most fruitful two months of the entire year. And we're going to finish this year strong. And we're going to know, okay, this is this, all the setbacks, all the disappointments we've had this year have just been setups for the greatest comeback in the year of miracles. We're going to have the best final part of this year, and to God be all the glory. Amen.